Hi there, I'm Grant Miller. I'm the project manager and communications lead uh, of the Zooniverse online citizen science platform. I'm based at the University of Oxford in England. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what the, the Zooniverse is and in fact the broader concept of, of citizen science and how it's such an important tool and method for, for modern science. I'm going to start with a little bit of history on uh, where the Zooniverse itself comes from. So uh, this is a very famous image in astronomy. It's the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Um, it's an um, image showing uh, around about 500 to 1000 galaxies in our universe. And I use this image just to demonstrate the, the simplicity of the idea of where the, where, the, where the Zooniverse actually came from, because it's spun out of one single project called Galaxy Zoo, which was launched in 2007. Um, and Galaxy Zoo was launched originally because there was a single researcher at the University of Oxford called Kevin, and he was having some serious problems with, uh, with scale. So uh, his research was looking at, at galaxies um, and uh, trying to figure out how they form and evolve. Uh, and one of the first steps he had to perform in his analysis was to split up the galaxy images he had into their uh, shapes, their morphologies. Um, and there's really only two major shapes of galaxy in our universe. There's the spiral galaxies. Uh, you can see over here, for example, beautiful spiral structure, very much like the, the Milky Way galaxy that we live in. And then there's your elliptical galaxies, uh, more kind of fuzzy, fuzzy blobs in the images, but still very interesting from a research point of view. Um, so this is the uh, first task he had to do, and he actually had almost a million images of galaxies, uh, and he was trying to do this task alone, um, and found that he could get through about 50,000 in just over a week if he basically did nothing else other than classifying galaxies and uh, doing that all day and, and hardly eating or sleeping or doing anything else other than classifying galaxies, at which point he had a kind of realization that this wasn't very feasible and wasn't the right way to go. Um, and the, as, the, as the story goes, though I'm never sure if it's exactly true, uh, he did what all good astronomers do when they have a problem, and that is go to the pub. And in the pub, he got talking to another astronomer from the department uh, called Chris Lintot, who um, was having this idea uh, at the time that, that there was another approach that could be taken here um, uh, using, using the internet, an online approach uh, that could help Kevin uh, get through all of his galaxy images. Uh, his idea was um, that you could put these images online and ask members of the public who might be interested to help out to do this very simple pattern recognition task, this initial task that Kevin had to do. But the, if, he, if he could get a few more people doing the task, then he could get through that initial processing phase much faster. So that's what they did. They set about building galaxyzoo.org. So Galaxy Zoo, this is the, is the original Zooniverse project, uh, back in, as I said, in 2007, as you can see from the website design here, it was built by a bunch of astronomers in 2007. Um, it doesn't look very modern, but it, it was pretty simple. The idea is that they would show a galaxy image in the center here and uh, on the right hand side there were a bunch of buttons that people could click based on the galaxy shape that they were seeing. So the first options were all for if it was a spiral galaxy and they were asked kind of in which direction are the spiral arms moving so for some extra information. Uh, if it was an elliptical galaxy there was just one button and then there was a couple of buttons down below uh, if it was something that wasn't just a spiral spiral or elliptical galaxy for example if it was wasn't wasn't a galaxy at all and it was a star or an image artifact maybe or um if it was uh, galaxies that were actually merging together and didn't have a, a defined defined sh single shape so they thought if they launched this they could maybe get a few hundred people really interested amateur astronomers for example uh, coming online hearing about it and and then really helping kevin out and that would really speed up his his data processing by a by a factor of 100, for example. Um, what actually happened, uh, and we can see here a plot of the first, tw uh, the first two days of Galaxy Zoo going live, is they, they got a lot more people than they thought that would be interested in. 
the kind of first lesson they learned about online citizen science right there was just how willing and interested people are to, to help out and take part in, in science. So, um, as I say, this plot shows you uh, the first two days of Galaxy Zoo. And on the, le on the y-axis, we have um, how many galaxies were being classified in an hour. Now, remember, Kevin was taking about a week, really hard working week, um, seven, seven days nonstop to do 50,000 on his own. And here we see uh, within, within 24 hours, the, the crowd online was doing more than that. Um, they didn't get a few hundred people taking part in the original Galaxy Zoo. They, they got more like a few hundred thousand people in the end around the world who were really interested to, to help out and take part. So um, right off the bat, they were amazed and surprised by, by, by the reaction the public had to helping out and just the power um, that was then available to them as far as getting through these data sets goes. So where did they go next from there? Well, this this problem this 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 problem of having too much data isn't just a problem for um, uh, galactic astronomers. Uh, it's a it, it's a problem that was rising up in, in, in the early two thousands for 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 pretty much all astronomers in, in in various different fields and and even beyond astronomy and, and, and physics. Uh, so the next step was was people started getting in touch and saying, you know, we have the exact same problem. We love the Galaxy Zoo website. Uh, we think we could do something similar with our data. Would you be willing to help? And that's kind of where the Zooniverse was born. So um, uh, we uh, started bringing in grant money to build other projects in, in, in other fields. One of the early ones I'm showing here, Planet Hunters, uh, showed how, how you could actually do this with, with different type of data, not just image data, um, so early, early theories in this kind of field were that if you showed people beautiful images, they would be more likely to, to take part. But Planet Hunters kind of kind of showed that, that that's not necessarily the case. Uh, in this case, we're showing light curves, so these plots of a star's brightness over time, to volunteers and asking them to look for periodic dips that might indicate that there's a transiting planet orbiting that star. Um, so, you know, to many people, these graphs might look very dry and boring, but again, hundreds of thousands of people uh, joined Planet Hunters within, you know, uh, a year of its launch uh, and, and really got invested and engaged in, in this project and in the science surrounding it. Um, so that showed that, you know, it doesn't just need to be pretty images. It, if you can frame your, uh, your needs and your science goal well, then people will help you out. And it doesn't, as I was saying, here, here are the penguins, as I, as I was saying, um, it doesn't just apply to astronomy. This, this problem uh, has, has, been, has been growing in, in all fields of research in the, in the last few decades. Uh, this ability to collect data, but not to process it at the same speed. Uh, so we have uh, researchers in Antarctica putting out hundreds of cameras, taking a picture every minute for a year, collecting millions of images of penguins that then have no way of counting the penguins in, in the images, and that's the job they need to do. Whereas uh, um, a human can do that job very, very fast. If you get thousands of humans, you can get through those millions of images very quickly. Uh, we have researchers in, uh, around the world putting out camera traps, especially in Africa in areas like the Serengeti. We've been working with researchers there for, for over a decade. Um, to, to take, again, their images from hundreds and hundreds of camera traps that are generating images any time an animal passes in front. And it's a very simple task for humans to, to spot the animal and then look up a list of the possible species it might be, see some example images, and then say what they think the animal is in the image. Um, in the biomedical field, uh, we're seeing that, that field really growing on this universe now. We have projects where we're showing people, for example, these electron microscope images of cells and asking them to draw around the cell wall to map out the structure of cells. Um, and even in, 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 the, um, in the humanities field, not, not science at all, we have people looking at uh, um, handwritten texts that have been digitized, for example. This is from a project we've launched called Shakespeare's World, where we're asking people to go through uh, old texts that are handwritten and, and transcribe the words that, that still uh, at this time cannot be transcribed by, by machine methods. Um, and even outside the, the realms of research, uh, we, there are applications. Um, within the last few years, we've run a, 
a handful of projects that are um, focused on disaster relief efforts. So we've been collaborating with um, uh, groups of first responders and groups who, who have satellite data so that when a disaster does happen and the first responders are, are called in, they can get in touch with us and say that they would like some, um, some information about w what the situation is on the ground. Uh, so we can take before and after satellite data, show it to the volunteers and put it online and really quickly get people going through images and looking for signs of damage, road blockages, flooding, and uh, whatever it might be that the the first responders really need to know uh, on their on their way to the scene so that they can be most effective when they get there uh, to really help people out. Um, and, you know, these these projects have to be spun up very fast and, and work very quickly and, and that, that kind of scale um, really benefits from having thousands of volunteers ready to go online right away. So one of the things that's led to this growth of projects on the Zooniverse in the last uh, five, six years is that we made a big change to the platform. Whereas in the past we used to bring in grant money to build individual projects and that was a very slow moving process, involved a lot of money, a lot of development time to be, make bespoke projects for each uh, researcher. We figured we would be best served actually spending some time making a platform that was generic and could be used by any researcher to build projects themselves uh, for free. So that, that's what we did. Um, we, we rejigged our website, we, we, we overhauled it and our platform. And now you'll see up in the top, um, menu navigation here, there's a button that says build a project. And it really is just as simple as clicking there to get started. And honestly, with it, within a few minutes, uh, within a lunch break, you can put together a, a prototype citizen science project. You can upload some images and set the tasks that you need people to do. It really is that quick to build on. Um, at that point, it wouldn't be shown to the public on, on, on the Zooniverse site. We do still vet the uh, the projects that want to become official Zooniverse projects using our kind of in-house expertise and also asking our volunteers for feedback. Uh, they're very integral to, to, to um, that point where we decide to release projects out uh, to the general public. Um, so far, we've launched over 300 uh, official Zooniverse projects in, in this way over the last 10 years. Uh, at the moment, you can see right down at the bottom of this slide, um, there are 81 live act active projects at the moment on the platform that really need um, volunteers' help. Um, and you can see you can actually filter by all these various disciplines here um, from, from history to medicine to nature and to, to space and, and physics. Um, so we really do cover a broad range of disciplines on the platform. So who are these people that are actually taking part? This is a really important part of citizen science and of the Zooniverse. That the, the, the key thing that makes it all happen are, are, is your volunteer community. So we actually have over 2 million registered volunteers. Uh, so since, since the platform began, um, we've had over 2 million people create an account. Though we don't actually force people to create accounts, yeah, you, can, you can contribute anonymously. Um, so there are a lot more people than that have actually taken part in projects but not created an account. Um, and we see people taking part from almost every country in the world, though we do see a, a heavy skew towards the United States and the UK where most of our projects are based. And of course, most of our projects are actually released initially in English, though we do have a translations platform that is allowing uh, research teams to to translate their projects into into their local languages, and we're seeing seeing some growth in 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 in, in places like South America and China, people coming on and actually able to take part in projects like Galaxy Zoo, but in Spanish and and Chinese um, and, and their native language, so that they can feel more comfortable because it can be you know citizen science can be quite scary to to volunteer, especially if it's in another language. This idea that they're doing something that is is real research can be can be a little uh, scary. So it's best to make it as comfortable and easy as possible for the volunteers to actually take part. We see a wide age range uh, of participants on the Zooniverse. We actually see a flatter age distribution than the general internet out towards the older ages. We have um, kind of unsurprisingly, we have a lot of uh, retirees who have time to actually contribute to, to volunteering efforts like citizen science taking part. But we also see a large amount of, of youngsters. We see participation in schools is growing. Uh, and, and really across the board, we have, we have people of all, all ages taking part across the world. 
I really like to look at, at, at uh, this breakdown. This is their education background when we've surveyed our participants and it shows that a large fraction of them do actually have you know uh, a university degree even even further into a master's or, or even a doctoral degree but i think the most important part of this is that is the other fraction who haven't been to university at all or who haven't even um who haven't, haven't got a university degree and we're seeing you know a, a quarter to a third of all volunteers on, on this universe are are in that are in that cohort and it's really amazing to see that this uh, citizen science can be an opportunity uh, for bringing people who, who don't have that university experience into an active research project right in to the front line giving them another another door to, to enter and to, into the field through that rather than going through the process that so many of us have gone through which is going to university <laughs> doing masters doing a PhD uh, it's another way of bringing people into science collaboration who might not have had those opportunities. And I think that's a really important thing about citizen science. And what are their motivations? Well, um, the, the overwhelming response uh, for when you ask volunteers on citizen science projects on the Zooniverse is that they're here because they're contributing to, to the research. Um, they are there to, to, to do work and to contribute and to be part of the, the research collaboration. In fact, only 50% of them uh, would, would self-report that they find it entertaining or fun. That's not really why they're there. They're there um, because they care about the science, they care about the research, and they care about being part of that community and, and, and collaboration. And obviously, a lot of them are, are, are driven by their interest in the actual topic that they're taking part in. Another important thing uh, we do on this universe is actually is actually examine uh, the idea, the motivation behind the volunteers, that the idea of citizen science, why people are taking part, what they can get out of taking part. A really important thing at the moment is um, is citizen science project starting to to really get on board with the idea that a citizen science project has to be a two way collaboration. It can't just be exploiting volunteers for the, for their brain power and not giving anything back. Most citizen science projects can't compensate their, their, their participants. They, they, this is pure volunteering. They can't co compensate them with any kind of monetary reward or prizes. So we need to think about other ways we can give back. And one of those ways is, is using citizen science as an educational resource. Um, and, and studies we've done on the Zooniverse, including this one here, show that actually it, that, that, that taking part in a citizen science project is correlated with learning. And, and uh, learning in that specific field of, uh, of science. So taking part in a, in, a, in a project can be beneficial to, to the volunteer in actually educating and giving them, as I was saying, that other opportunity to learn and become involved in, in that field of research. So I wanna talk now a little bit more about the future of citizen science, the future of the universe, where are we going next? Um, I'm sure a lot of you might recognize this. Um, this is the uh, VRC Ribbon Observatory, formerly known as the LSST, home, home of the LSST, um, which hopefully will still be taking first light uh, sometime soon, maybe in, in 2021. Uh, one of the reasons it's super important from an astronomy point of view and from a citizen science point of view especially is that it's going to kind of blow the, the scale that we currently have as far as data collection goes out of the water. So uh, the question is, can citizen science scale with the future of, of astronomy and research? You know, we're at, we're at kind of a sweet spot in the last 10 to 20 years where we were collecting a large amount of data that couldn't be processed by small teams or machines, but could be pro processed by, uh, you know, maybe a few thousand volunteers. The LSST is going to collect data at a rate that even if you've got a few thousand volunteers around the world, you still won't be able to go through all that data. So we need to adapt, we need to change. So where is citizen science going in the near future to, to help with this kind of problem? Well, at Zooniverse, we've been working on, on trying to figure this out. How, how are we gonna cope with this data when it starts coming in from surveys like LSST? And the key for us is integration of, of machine learning, integration of AI and machine learning methods in alongside the human volunteers. So on our Supernova Hunters project, which is a very straightforward project looking for 
for these uh, supernovae. Uh, we show a before and after image and we ask if, if, if there's anything new there that that volunteer thinks might be a supernova. Simple yes, no. People just look at the, the image and say yes, I think there's one here or no, I don't think there is. Um, using that data we were getting for the human volunteers, we used it to train a machine learning algorithm to try and do the same task. Um, and it started getting very good results. But the, the key here, the key result from this project that, that we found, uh, which is contained in this slightly confusing plot, is that um, the, the human volunteers were great at retrieving supernovae. The machines were great at retrieving supernovae. Um, so which one do you go with? Do you take the machine answers or the human answers? And we actually found that, um, kind of unsurprisingly, the best, the best solution is to take a combination of both. If you want to retrieve the most amount of real supernovae um, uh, and get rid of the most bogus um, uh, false positives, then the actual best way to do it is to take a combination of the humans and machines answers. And this was our first kind of published result from the Zooniverse showing machine learning integrated within a citizen science project that showed that the, the power here really was, was uh, lay in combining uh, humans and machines. And that's really what we're focusing on now going forward. And we think this is the way to, 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 to challenge this, this, um, to this, this massive problem of scale that we're about to deal with in astronomy and in many other fields. Um, the next, uh, the next approach we took to this was slightly different on, on our flagship project, Galaxy Zoo. Uh, one of the researchers there was working on training um, uh, a bunch of machine learning algorithms actually on, on doing the, the simple task of classifying galaxies by morphology, the, you know, the original task on the original Galaxy Zoo. In this case, he's getting them to spit out multiple different um, predictions for what the type of galaxy is. But then the machine's actually telling us which images um, it's most unsure about and could do with more data. So in the end, it spits out a list of galaxies that it could do with more information on and a list that it, it doesn't really need that much more information on, it's pretty confident about. And what we're doing then is we're taking these galaxies that it needs more information on and putting them back into Galaxy Zoo in front of the human volunteers to get that human label information to get more information for the machine to train it up and this is happening in an active loop so this is happening every day every week uh, these galaxies are being processed going uh, by the human volunteers being fed back into the machine learning alg algorithm that's then spitting out uh, the the galaxy that it needs more help on which is going back to the volunteers uh, and this is actually actively running on on galaxy zoo you'll see that if you go to galaxyzoo.org right now this is what the landing page looks like uh, down in the bottom here, you'll see that there's two options of workflow. One is called Classic, that's the original Galaxy Zoo workflow, no machines, no AI involved. Uh, the other one's called Enhanced, this is the one where we're actively putting in these machine learn learning, um, we're actively putting machine learning into the loop and, and getting that feedback loop between humans and machines. Uh, one of the really positive results we've seen studying this since we launched this Enhanced workflow is that given the choice, 95% of our volunteers have actually chosen to collaborate with machines and, and take part in this enhanced workflow. We're very transparent about how the workflow works and, 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 and how that relationship between the machines and volunteers works. Um, we believe at the Zooniverse that, that in, in citizen science especially, you have to be as transparent as possible with the volunteers. They are your collaborators after all. You shouldn't be hiding machine learning behind anything. Uh, you should be telling them up front what's happening, why you're doing it, and why it's beneficial for the science. And when given that sort of messaging, we see the overwhelming majority of, of our volunteers favor taking part in that enhanced workflow because they understand that this is the most efficient way to process the data. And that's the most important thing, not wasting their time, not wasting our time, but getting through the data as fast as possible so we can produce the science. Um, so that is where we're heading with the, with the future of the universe is trying to um, integrate machine learning as much as possible, not just in astronomy, but um, it, it, across all of our disciplines, especially uh, leading the way at the moment is the, is the ecology, uh, wildlife um, discipline where we're, we're, we're working with hundreds of different researchers who are all 
you know, working with camera trap images of animals. There's a lot of work that has gone in in the last 10 years to, to analyzing these images with machines and making predictions on the animals that you see in there. Um, but one of the things I want to raise here is kind of a, uh, a reminder that even, in, even though we're introducing more and more machine learning and machine learning techniques and methods are getting more advanced and getting better and getting more accurate, there still is a, a very large space still reserved for, for the human volunteers on citizen science projects. And we see this as still for, for years to come to be a collaboration between humans and machines and not just machines replacing humans in, in these kind of projects. One of the one of the key elements uh, that I like to point out is something that we've named the the Zorilla problem on the Zooniverse. So this comes from our first um, uh, ecology project, which is called Snapshot Serengeti, um, in which there was a list of forty eight species to identify. Most of them very common, and people know them like giraffes and lions, uh, wildebeest, for example but some of them not so common. Uh, and there was a field guide to tell people what those animals were and what they looked like and how to spot them. One of those animals was the Zorilla, which I will admit freely that I had never heard of once before joining this universe. And most people haven't either. It's actually a small, um, small weaselly skunk-like creature. It's black and white. Um, and the reason that it's a problem <laughs> is because in millions of images, it's only been identified twice. And a lot of machine learning methods, especially in ecology, rely on being able to train a machine based on a lot of training data. So you give it hundreds of thousands of example images of, of what the animals look like in your data, and then a machine learns how to spot them. When you've only got two images, it's very hard to train a machine um, to spot them um, accurately. But if you show two images of a Zorilla to, to a human, even to a child, especially to a child sometimes, uh, they'll be able to take those two images and immediately go away and look through the data and spot similar animals. And um, we're just so advanced at taking a small amount of training data and applying it to a wider context. We're so still so far ahead of machines as far as that goes. So this is one area in which um, which humans will still be able to be in the loop alongside machines in in all of these projects because the machines may be processing the really obvious stuff. But the question comes down to the Zorilla problem. What, what about when there's stuff in there that isn't that common, that machines just don't really know about, and, and humans can be used uh, to, to, to still identify those kind, of, those kind of species and objects, for example. The other, uh, the other reason that humans are still amazing to have on a, on a citizen science project is to do with serendipitous discovery. So, um, a lot of the times when you have a problem of scale, it's uh, the, you know, the fact that you haven't looked through all your data, you don't really know what's in there. You know what your research goals are, you know what you're looking for, but there's a lot of stuff in there that, you, that might surprise you and you just don't know because you, by definition, you haven't had the chance to go through it. So we see this happening again and again and again on the Zooniverse in, in, in all the projects we launch that, that there are serendipitous discoveries. Thousands of volunteers looking through millions of images tend to uncover the rare and weird stuff. Uh, this example I have here called Hannes Verwerp. Um, uh, uh, Verwerp is Dutch for, for thing or, or object. Uh, this comes from um, the very early days of, of the original Galaxy Zoo project. Within weeks, uh, this uh, um, uh, woman, uh, Hanny van Arkel here, who you can see pictured, um, uncovered a, this blue smudgy object on one of the galaxy images she was looking at and was really intrigued by it because she'd never seen anything like it in all the other thousands of images she'd looked at. She assumed it was something she didn't know about but the researchers would know about and the other uh, volunteers on, on galaxies would know about. So she got in touch first of all with the other volunteers uh, via the forum and uh, those volunteers said they'd never seen anything like it either but uh, you know to get in contact with the with the researchers at the University of Oxford who would almost certainly know what it is. Um, and when she managed to get in touch with the researchers, they were also kind of intrigued because they hadn't seen anything exactly like it in these galaxy images before either. So they got some um, follow-up time on the Hubble uh, Space Telescope to observe this, this cloud, this object, and found that it was actually an entirely new type of astrophysical object that, that had never been detected 
before in the history of, of astronomy uh, or the history of even using telescopes, you know, 400 years of people observing the night sky and no one had seen or, or at least catalogued or identified this, this object until Hanny Van Arkel was sitting at home on her computer and spotted it on a citizen science project. It's now named after her, it's Hanny's Ververt. Um, so this is this type of serendipitous discovery. Um, it's very hard to, to, to do these with a machine because by definition, they don't know that they're to look for this stuff. You train a machine to look for what you want it to look for. So a machine would look at this image, it would identify the galaxy and it would classify the galaxy um, probably very accurately nowadays for a simple spiral galaxy, but it would completely gloss over and pass over this, this blue smudge. It, it doesn't get curious and, and go off um, go off script like humans do. One of the most amazing um, aspects of, of, of humans on, on sits and science projects is that they have this ability to just look for, for different things and run off in their own direction and bring you back some, some information that you, you weren't expecting but can really uh, lead to, to amazing discoveries and new research. Um, so let me just finish up here with a little bit of a summary slide about what we've gone over. Um, the first point is that you know citizen science is, is a proven and important approach for dealing with large scale research. Um, I, I should mention that the that, that projects on the Zooniverse alone have led to hundreds of peer reviewed publications in, in serious science journals. It is now a very well accept, accepted message, especially in, in space physics, astrophysics uh, uh, and in, uh, in ecology. Um, and, and it's becoming more accepted uh, as it should in, in pretty much all, all disciplines of research. Um, two, citizen science is an excellent way of engaging and educating the general public in your science. Um, you know, it, um, I was saying that, that we've shown that uh, giving back to the volunteers is very important and that actually volunteers can learn uh, and become part of a scientific collaboration through citizen science and taking part in, in, in projects. Um, on the Zooniverse, um, we see, as far as engaging goes, we, we see thousands of people taking part in each project they launch. So you're really bringing in, you know, a large community of, of people to, to learn about and, and take part and collaborate in your research. So that's a fantastic tool for your own research as well and for your own engagement. Um, AI and um, machine learning uh, integration is the future of citizen science. Um, but human volunteers are very much still a key component of the projects and going forward I think a combination of these two is going to be the strongest way of getting through the, the large scale data that we need to get through in our fields. Um, for uh, the Zooniverse is a free and easy to use platform and you can use it to build and deploy your citizen science project. So as I said before, you completely free, completely open, uh, even the code's open on GitHub if you want to look it up and, and fork it and, and use it yourself. Uh, but yeah, you know, the platform is very easy to use. Uh, you can get started right away on a lunch break, put up some images, set your, set your tasks, and you're already running with your own version, prototype version of a citizen science project. So uh, head to zooniverse.org to, to get started. Um, and Thanks very much for listening. I uh, look forward to uh, your questions and comments in the Q&A. Thanks very much.